Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by saying that we're continuing to negotiate with the Democrats to get our great workers and small businesses all over the country taken care of. I think we, uh, we're getting close to a deal. Could happen. Could happen. A lot of good work has been going on, and uh, we could have an answer tomorrow. And we're going to see what, uh, what exactly does take place. We're also looking at helping our hospitals and our rural hospitals who have been hurt very badly. The rural hospitals for a long time have not been treated properly. We're looking to help them and beyond. So we're looking at hospitals also as part of the package. And we'll see how that all comes out. But uh, a lot of good things are happening. Some very good negotiations. I uh, just got off the phone with the Secretary of the Treasury. And we have some very good negotiations going on right now. And uh, I think you could have a nice answer tomorrow, but we'll see. America continues to make steady progress in our war against the virus. As of today, we've tested 4.18 million Americans. That's a record anywhere in the world. The United States has now conducted more total tests than all of the following nations combined. France, the United Kingdom, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, India, Austria, Australia, Sweden, and Canada. And our testing is expanding very rapidly by millions and millions of people. So we've, uh, we've done more testing than all of these countries combined. France, United Kingdom, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, India, Austria, and Australia. Sweden and Canada. That's something, right? We're doing a great job. We're, we are, this team is an incredible team. And that includes Army Corps of Engineers, a lot of our military people, our admirals, our generals. Kind of one of our great admirals here has done an incredible job. You haven't slept too much in the last two months either. Look at him. <laughs> but uh, somebody said to me, President, you look tired. I said, I should be tired. We should all be tired, but we have to win, right? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, the President, the Vice President will lead a call with our nation's governors from FEMA headquarters, Mike, yes, to review what more they can do and do together to develop locally tailored testing strategies, working very hard with governors now on testing. We want to help them out. Before the call, we'll send them a full list of all of the large laboratory machines in the states. They have a lot of machinery in the states that some aren't that aware of, but they, they're there and they're really high quality machines, by the way and the potential capacity of those machines if they're fully utilized. A couple of them didn't know that they could be utilized in a different manner. They're only up to 10 percent, and they can go 90 percent more. Many governors are still relying on their state laboratories rather than the full and much larger capacity that is available to them. As an example, commercial laboratories such as Quest and LabCorp, these are massive laboratories that can handle a lot more than they're being sent. Uh, a few days ago, it was at 30 percent. They're only at 30 percent capacity now. I don't know. They're probably the same, but they have a lot of capacity. In addition, academic laboratories, big research labs, uh, there's tremendous capacity out there. And some of them want the fast, uh, you know, the instant uh, uh, Abbott machine, which just came about due, due to the research during this little short period of time. And it's very quick. but. Uh, these labs can do it very quickly also, and they're, they're massive. They can handle much more, much more than the machine, the small machine can handle. We continue to procure millions of swabs, test collectors. I have something here, just happen to have a, it's a swab. Looks innocent, not very complicated. Anybody like to see what it looks like? Should I open it? Does open everybody? It open it up. I will. I will. This is what it's about, right? Is it, uh, does it remind you of something? It reminds you of this, right? One's a swab, one's a Q-tip. It's actually different. It's very sophisticated, actually. But it's a little bit like, so this is the swab. And uh, we've ordered a lot of them. They have a lot of them. Some of them, uh, some of the states, uh, they were shipped to states, and the states don't know where they are. 
And uh, but that's that's it. Why don't we give this to uh, Karen? Perhaps she'll take an extra test. <laughs> right? But this is a big deal. And uh, we're working on it, and we're working with the companies. And uh, I think in the end, we're going to have we're going to have a we're going to have a tremendous uh, a tremendous success. No, nobody is close to us. No country is close to us. In fact, and I appreciate it very much. The Wall Street Journal wrote a fantastic piece. A highly respected gentleman, Christopher Demuth, and uh, this piece was just in the Wall Street Journal. Weekend edition, and Trump rewrites the book on emergencies. That's what's happened too. And we uh, just read one paragraph. Uh, he's given pride of place to federalism and private enterprise, lauding the patriotism and proficiency of our fantastic governors and mayors. Meaning, I do call them fantastic when it's appropriate. And our incredible business leaders and genius companies, I guess I probably use those terms, too, when they're doing a good job. When they're not doing a good job, I don't use those terms. Our heroic doctors and nurses and orderlies and our tremendous truckers, they have all done good jobs. By shouting out many of them by name and documenting their deeds on a fully daily basis, he has vivified the American way in action. Once it was reluctantly aroused. It was hard to get it aroused, and it is hard to get it aroused, but we got it aroused. When asked why he has not issued orders for nationwide home and business lockdowns, he has emphasized that the intensity of the epidemic varies widely and is best met by calibrated state and local judgments. That's the judgments of governors and local people and added pointedly that such steps would conflict with the Constitution. But very importantly, he's, he's just a very respected gentleman. To see this was a very nice feeling. Not for me, necessarily, but for all of the people that have worked with us. I mean, they've, they've worked so hard. And we've developed tests that are so fantastic. We've, we've um, come up with things that nobody had ever heard of. And we did it during, during this pandemic. We did it under pressure. It's called Reaction Under Pressure. It's pretty amazing what our people have done. And that includes all of our military people and our uh, CDC, uh, just about everybody you can imagine, including Tony and Deborah. And they've worked long hours. There's nobody that's uh, getting a lot of sleep. We're close to finalizing. I want to thank the writer, of Christopher, for this article. And it's a great article. That was, frankly, the least of it, what I read. It was a great article. We appreciate it. We're close to finalizing a second partnership through which a U.S. manufacturer would convert its existing plant to produce over 10 million additional swabs per month. And we should be ready to announce this in a very short period of time. Uh, we also uh, are going to be using and we're preparing to use the Defense Production Act to increase swab production in one U.S. facility by over 20 million additional swabs per month. Uh, we've uh, had a little difficulty with one, so we're going to call in, as we have in the past, as you know, we're calling in the Defense Production Act, and we'll be getting swabs very easily. Swabs are easy. Ventilators are hard. Ventilators are a big deal, and we are now the king of ventilators. We have so many ventilators. You know, I said nobody that needed a ventilator has been turned down. It's pretty amazing. Nobody. Uh, we're working with the world-class team at Oak Ridge National Laboratory to use its injection molding capacity to potentially produce over 10 million collection tubes per week. That's tremendous numbers. In the meantime, the Supply Chain and Logistics Task Force continues to surge testing and needed supplies all throughout America. Uh, Mike's team and the task force, they just met. They've been meeting virtually every day. And uh, it's a great team, right? It's a great team. They've been uh, doing a great job, Mike. You've been doing a great job. Many governors are doing this incredible work, and they're working with us very closely on testing and working in their states. And again, it should be a local thing because it's point. It's all these points within a state. Uh, but we're helping them a lot. 
And we want to help them a lot. We're going to help them more than a lot, actually, if you think about it, with what we've done. Think of it, we've done more than all those countries combined. We're encouraging them to share their successful strategies with other governors. Some of the governors are doing a better job than others. The robust capacity that we've brought online will empower governors to deploy sophisticated strategies so they can safely reopen their states. Uh, some people believe in testing very strongly, and other people believe in it less strongly, but still, it's a very good thing to have. I think we can say that. Some people believe in it like they can't exist without testing, and other people don't believe in it nearly as much. Uh, they can see how they're doing, and they feel how they're doing. And they've been pretty vocal about that. I think you know pretty much who I'm talking about. But I believe if they want it, we should give it to them and get it, get it for them and work with them. You must remember that the governors wanted to have total control over the opening of their states, but now they want to have us, the federal government, uh, do the testing. And again, testing is, is local. You can't have it both ways. Testing is a local thing. And it's very important. It's great, but it's a local thing. And uh, we're going to get we're going to get it done uh, to a level in a very short period of time because all of these, all of the swabs are coming in, all of the necessary materials, a lot of them, as I said, are already there, but a lot of people don't know that yet. Uh, but we'll be doing uh, testing at a level. Already we're doing testing at a level nobody's ever done before, but we'll be doing testing at a level that the biggest tester in the world will be very happy very soon. And it is. It's very much like ventilators. Uh, you don't hear the word mentioned. And that's much tougher, much tougher when you have to build these machines. We built thousands of machines. We'll more than uh, help the governors, and we'll make sure that uh, everything goes well, just like it did with ventilators, just frankly like it did with face masks on a much easier subject. As face masks, again, everything's easier than a ventilator. Ventilators are tough. But now, uh, I spoke yesterday with the President of Mexico and with various other countries. We're going to be helping them with ventilators. We have tremendous numbers of ventilators. Uh, in fact, I, I hear, I understand that uh, Governor Cuomo is going to be sending up to Massachusetts some of the excess ventilators that uh, we were able to get, and that's great. I think it's a great thing. The number of new hospital admissions is also significantly down. When you look at these numbers, it's a uh, so Good thing to see, other than the fact that we also know how people have been just ravaged by this, by this curse, by this uh, horrible scourge, plague, call it. It's got many different names. In many of the hotspots, including a 50 percent decline over a nine-day period in New York City. That's a fantastic decline. It's a beautiful thing to see after going through the opposite. We continue to see improvement with declining trajectory of cases in Seattle, Detroit, New Orleans, Indianapolis, and Houston metro areas. More evidence that our aggressive strategy is working, and I thank the American people for their selfless devotion. The American people have done a hell of a job. We're uh, saving countless lives, though, and again, I'll say it, because I always wanted to say, well, can you leave it open? Nobody ever heard of anything like this. Not since 1917, more than 100 years ago, has anything like this happened. And in those days, they had no real communication, so you couldn't say, go inside, don't, you know, people just died. Almost 100 million people, it's reported. It's uh, tough. So, you know, the American people, what they've done is, uh, is incredible. And they've learned a lot, you know, and you see people uh, picketing a little bit, and uh, they want to get out. They want to get out and get back with their lives, and that's good. But they have learned a lot. They've learned about distancing, even now, at least until this thing totally goes away. They've learned about their washing their hands and all of the different things that we've been talking about ad nauseum for so long. And uh, they get it. They get it. In some places, the governors are ready to go, and other places, they can't go yet, and they won't go. They want to. They have to have it safe. I want it to be safe, too. It has to be safe. And again, I, I have to say this. I can't emphasize it strongly enough. Uh, I'm probably going to show you charts of some of the countries that are really having trouble. And uh, one in particular is having a massive problem 
where they said, let's go, we're just going to keep going. Well, they're the lines that you're, we're famous for now, some are flat and some are up. Uh, this is like a rocket ship. This country is, uh, and they didn't, they decided, let's go and let's wing it. That's, uh, you know, they thought it was okay, but it's, uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And there's another couple, there's one in particular that everybody thinks did it, but the people are staying in. Okay, you know, not, uh, the head of a country doesn't have to say stay in. These people are smart people. They know what's going on. They see what's going on. So they don't have to say, they can say they're not doing that, but the people are staying inside. There are not a lot of people outside sitting at cafes, uh, despite what the mode of a country is. But if you look at Europe, most countries have done this. A couple tried not to. Italy tried not to, and they held it. And uh, Spain tried not to. They went that way. France tried not to. I mean, nobody wants to do this. It's a, it's a brutal step. We're going to close down your country. Who ever heard of a thing like this? But we would have had millions of people die if we didn't do this. Millions of people. And I believe that, Mike. I think, you know, in looking at things that we've been looking at over the last couple of days, I think, and, and really over the last couple of weeks, from the time we did it, shortly thereafter, I said we made the right decision in closing down, made the right decision on borders, uh, banning people coming in from China, banning ultimately people coming in from Europe. Uh, but we would have had millions of deaths instead of it looks like we'll be at about a 60,000 mark, which is 40,000 less than the lowest number thought of. So this isn't a case where people would say, oh, we would have had that number. It's similar to a flu. It's not the same thing as a flu at all, because if we wouldn't have done anything, you would have had. So a flu would have 35. It goes from 27 to 35, 40, 50 sometimes. It's over a long period of time, much different. It's even a much different death. To be honest, it's a much different death. This is violent. CMS is finalizing new guidelines for doctors and patients to resume elective surgeries. It's a big thing. A lot of hospitals were closed. They couldn't do any elective surgeries. They'll be able to start doing that. Procedures and medical care that needs to be done in person. As long as the rate of infections remains low in a community, we want patients to be able to go to their doctors, get clinically tested, and uh, have work done, surgeries, receive treatment for chronic conditions, and resume preventative care. So we'll be allowing that to happen very soon. Uh, we had no capacity in the hospitals with what happened with the, uh, with the plague. We had no capacity to do it. If your doctor believes you need a treatment in person, you can get a treatment now. You can and should get a treatment now. We are asking that healthcare facilities have plans in place to keep patients safe during their visits. Some places like New York, New Jersey, where they really got hit hard, uh, it's going to be a little bit tougher. They've done a great job, but they really were a, a center. I mean, they were a center. I was watching that. It was incredible. But now they're, they're leveling off, and I think they'll be coming down very soon. Uh, Administrator Seema Verma will be telling you a little bit more about it. Mike's going to say a few words. Seema will then speak, tell you a little bit more about that. My administration continues to execute our massive military operation to supply our hospitals with equipment they need and beds if necessary. But it looks like we're totally covered on beds. We have uh, plenty of beds. It's highly unlikely. That would be bad news if we needed more beds, but it looks like it's going just the opposite direction. Uh, I want to thank uh, Governor Cuomo, the relationship there for this whole thing. We're, we're building hospitals. It was very good. We built a little bit more than we needed, and that's good, as opposed to building a little bit less. That's not good. But uh, he's worked very well with us. The governor of Louisiana has been great on the bed, on that whole situation with the beds. Uh, frankly, uh, the governor of Michigan was very good with us on on uh, beds. You know, it's a very complex subject. You need buildings, or you have to do tents, or you have to do a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. But the Army Corps of Engineers was fantastic. They were fantastic. Uh, Florida, likewise. Governor DeSantis. Uh, 
And I could name probably uh, six other locations. I'll tell you one. Uh, California was fantastic. He was really good. He was really good. And I appreciate the fact that he he said what he wanted to say, and he wasn't letting the the press force him into saying something that he didn't want to say. So I appreciate it very much. Governor of California, uh, he really uh, he worked very hard. We worked together. He worked very hard. The federal government is currently procuring more than 100,000 ventilators through new production or purchases with thousands already delivered. We've delivered thousands of brand new ventilators all throughout the country. New York would be, I guess, the biggest uh, user. And uh, they are now taking some of their excess ventilators, which is great, and they're sending them up to Massachusetts. I think it's 400. And uh, that's, that's a great thing. Our total supply of ventilators continues to exceed by a lot total expected demand. Uh, Governor Cuomo said today that uh, no one who needed a ventilator was denied a ventilator. That's a beautiful statement. I appreciate it. And uh, all governors are in that same position. Uh, we do have a clip that I thought would be appropriate to put up today. Um, it's, it'll take two minutes, and I think you'll find it interesting, but we appreciate it. And let's see if we can do that. You'll turn out the lights, and we'll see if we can do that. Thank you. Phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, we bent the curve. We flattened the curve. Government did it. People did it. But government facilitates people's actions, right? Uh, we had to double the hospital capacity in New York State. Uh, that's what all the experts said. Uh, President brought in the Army Corps of Engineers. They built uh, 2,500 beds at Javits that uh, Michael and Northwell were operating. It was a phenomenal accomplishment. Uh, close to a thousand people have gone through Javits. Luckily, we didn't need the 2,500 beds, but all the projections said we did need it, and more, by the way. Uh, so it, it, these were just extraordinary efforts and acts of mobilization. And uh, the federal government stepped up and was a great partner, and I'm the first one to say it. Uh, we needed help, and they were there. State and local governments were fantastic. The hospital system was fantastic. Fantastic. New Yorkers were fantastic. And that is an undeniable fact. Just to look at what they said was going to happen. CDC, Coronavirus Task Force, Cornell, McKinsey, all of them. And they had a line up here. And the actual line is down here. What do you owe the variants to? Heroic efforts on behalf of people as facilitated by government, federal and state. They left out the good part. Great, great job, fellas. What was the good part? They did a better job on ventilators. No. Andrew had something else to say that was really nice, but we won't go through that. Uh, but he really, I mean, it was really uh, a good statement. Do you want to put the rest of it up, or do you not have it? I just think it's so good because it's bipartisan. You know, this is not about Democrats, Republicans. This is about a thing that hit our country, the likes of which has never happened to us before. Wars, those, those wars, Civil War, sure. But the First World War, the Second World War, they're not fought on this country. This is being fought in this country, but it's being fought in 184 countries all over the world. It's terrible. But I want to thank Andrew, Governor Cuomo, for the uh, statement. He actually, if you go a little bit further, it was, uh, it was even uh, far beyond even that. So it was good. Do you remember? Huh? They're going to work on getting the first Well, that's okay. Whatever. But it's, uh, it's, he said some really good things. And, and that's a, it, it makes people feel good. It's actually the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Christopher was saying, I want to make people feel good too. I want to make, when they're doing a good job, I want to make people feel good. I want the Admiral to feel good. He's worked so hard. Mike has worked so hard. And, uh, 
it was it was very nice. It was on this morning. It was all it was Andrew this morning. It's uh, it's a little uh, uh, longer clip than that, but you'll see. It was really a, a very nice thing that he said, and people really appreciate that because they've done a great job. The federal government's done a great job. I mean, we with all of it, and this is easy. The uh, the swabs are that's easy. We have them coming by the tens of millions. We have them coming at a level that you'll have so many swabs you won't know what to do with them. That's easy. Uh, so uh, they'll all they'll all be there. They're, a lot of them are there already. Uh, they're learning about their testing capacity that they didn't know about that uh, that we have in the various labs, including academic. They have to remember you have a lot of these big colleges that have labs that are totally ready to help. But I want to thank the uh, Dynamic Ventilator Reserve because uh, what they've done is incredible. That's a capital DVR, by the way, an innovative public-private partnership. That's what we created. We're gaining access to up to 65,000 additional ventilators in hospitals across the nation that can be redeployed very quickly to areas with the greatest need when they're not in use. And we right now have almost 10,000 in our reserve. We've been able to give away thousands, like we helped Andrew or we helped uh, Phil in New Jersey is doing a great job. Andrew would tell you that, too. They have a very good relationship working together and working with us. Uh, but we have uh, now we're back up to almost 10,000. And this is after giving away tens of thousands of ventilators. And we're going to fill up the reserves of states. We're going to work with them. So in case this happens again, uh, but we're also going to help other countries. I was telling you, the president of Mexico, we're going to be sending uh, a pretty large quantity to Mexico. They very much need them, and to other countries where they need them. Uh, we've had I've had about six calls with leaders of other countries, and they need them. They're, they're hard to they're hard to get done. We did our companies stepped up, and they did an incredible job. Some of them were automobile companies, and they take an assembly line and they say, "Guess what? We're making ventilators now for a while." But because of the historic steps that we've taken, uh, I remain confident that every American who needs any of this equipment, any of the things we're talking about, uh, will either have it now, already has it, or will shortly have it. Through the Project Airbridge, we've completed 64 flights carrying over 600 million pieces of personal protective equipment, such as gloves, gowns, and other medical gear, with 50 more flights scheduled in the very near future. The team doing that is an incredible team of military people and young geniuses. Some are older geniuses, but mostly younger geniuses, I think I can say. Some of people that made vast amounts of money in Silicon Valley, and, you know, these are very smart people. The job they've done is incredible. And I said, where do you come from? Well, I sold my company, sir. Oh, really? How much did you get? I think he said $700 million. I said, that's good. You want to work for the government? No, I want to help our country, sir. And it's tremendous brain power. It's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, young, incredible people that love this country, and they worked with the military. Admiral, you would say they were pretty smart, right? Yes, sir. They were in the upper scales of IQ. Yes, they were the upper. They were the, they were the top scale, I'll tell you. And they're great people. But FEMA is working to commit another $384 million to produce another $64 million gowns for health care. These are the highest quality, where they're very safe. When you put them on, they're safe. Uh, very important. The quality of the gown is very important. It's people in different places, different countries, they're wearing gowns with cuts in them, and these are very safe. I want to thank America's textile manufacturers for their partnership in this remarkable undertaking. Two U.S. companies, Haynes and Standard Textile, are on track to produce 5 million gowns by the end of the month. And that's really moving. That's really moving. Uh, two great companies, you know the companies. Another great American company, Honeywell, recently began manufacturing N95 masks in Rhode Island, where they converted a factory in less than five weeks instead of the nine months it was normally expected to take. So they've already done it. And they did it so rapidly. Five weeks instead of nine months. It's amazing, the spirit of this country. It's really about the spirit of the country. We said, do it, do it fast. But they did it in uh, 
And this is this was a major conversion to this is a different world. Honeywell is hiring more than 1,000 American workers to produce 20 million masks per month. 20 million masks a month. Thanks to the Defense Production Act, we'll be receiving another 40 million masks over the next few weeks. And uh, I also want to thank 3M because they really stepped up. We had a little dispute at the beginning, but that got worked out quickly, and they've been doing a great job, 3M. They really have been. I want to thank their great CEO. We, uh, we had a little skirmish, but it worked out well. And they're doing a lot of work right now on masks and other things. This production is in addition to the 55 million N95 masks my administration has already distributed. Plus, we ordered, and it's coming in soon, 500 million masks. You would think, what are you going to do with them? They get used rapidly. Uh, in addition to that, as you know, we sterilize masks now. Great company in Ohio, recommended by the governor of Ohio strongly. And it's doing very well, and they're sterilizing. A lot of the masks can be sterilized up to 20 times, so that's like buying 20 masks. And I always wondered, why aren't they sterilizing these masks? They're pretty, some of them are pretty sophisticated masks, and some you can't because of the material. Others you can. But uh, we have uh, actually two companies that do this, but one company I know very well in Ohio, and they're doing a great job. So they're sterilizing masks up to 20 times you can sterilize a certain type of mask. To these numbers in perspective, and to put them into perspective, American healthcare providers use an estimated 25 million N95 masks nationwide in a typical year. So a typical year, 25 million, that means we've secured nearly four times as many N95 masks in recent weeks as we would an entire healthcare industry during a typical year. Over a matter of a couple of weeks, we had more masks than we would do in a year. Think of that, over a couple of weeks. Moreover, we're bringing supply chains back home, and we've learned a lot about supply chains. We've learned uh, that it's nice to make things in the U.S. I've been saying that for a long time. One of the reasons I ran for office, because we started making things everywhere but here. And if one thing comes out of this, more than anything else, it's that we should make product in the United States. And these supply chains, they sound wonderful. But if one country has a problem, the whole chain is ruined. And I've been saying it for a long time. I ran partially on that. I ran partially on that. I ran on that, and I ran very strongly against China. And then we made a great trade deal where they buy $250 billion. They're supposed to. And uh, they're paying tariffs. They paid us tens of billions of dollars. I've given. 12 billion one year, 16 billion another year, and 19 billion to our farmers and ranchers who were targeted. But, uh, you know, I ran on China and other countries the way they were ripping us off. They were ripping off our country. And China understood that. I mean, China fully understood that. And uh, they're, they're big, strong, smart people. And uh, I wasn't friendly, and it wasn't a friendly situation. And we ended up making an incredible deal with China for tens of billions of dollars of product, 40 to 50 billion dollars to the farmers. The most they ever spent was 15 to 16. Now they're supposed to spend 40 to 50. Now, of course, the, uh, the virus came along, and I'm not happy. I'm not happy. I let them know I'm not happy. So, you know, we had a great relationship with — we had a very bad relationship with China. Then we had a good relationship because we made a great deal. But we're not happy. This is not a good thing that happened. Came out of China, so we're not we're not in a position where uh, we're going to say much yet. But uh, the deal itself is great. The deal is it's going to put many many people to work in our country. But uh, all of that has to be taken into account when you look at all of the people that are dying in our country, but all over the world. All over the world, people are dying. I had a G7 call, and their economies are in tatters. They're shattered, the G7 countries. You have Japan and Germany and France, and the different com countries. Uh, Italy, look at what happened to Italy. Look at what happened to these countries. Look at what happened to Spain. Look what happened to Spain, how, 
how incredible. It's just been shattered. And so many other countries are shattered. So nobody ever thought this could have happened, a thing like this. It's very, very sad. But if we've learned something, it's about supply chains. I, I just saw yesterday where when the auto industry gets back, they have a problem because there's a, a supply chain going through a different country. And this has been going on for years, for decades. I, I always said it was no good. Why do, why do we make it? Why do you need a supply chain? Make — very simple, make your parts here. They get one part from this country, one part from that country. It's all over the place. The problem is, if one country has a problem, you have no car or whatever it is you're making. So we've learned uh, a good lesson. I think a lot of smart people knew that before. But we've uh, distributed many hundreds of millions of masks. This pandemic has underscored the vital importance of reshoring our supply chains and bringing them back into the United States, where they belong, where they should have never left. What happens if you're in a war and you have a supply chain where half of your supplies are given to you by other countries? Who are, who are the people that thought of this? These are globalists. It doesn't work. It certainly doesn't work during rough times, bad times, or dangerous times. So we're going to continue to fight the virus. We're talking to China. We spoke to them a long time ago about going in. We want to go in. We want to see what's going on. And uh, we weren't exactly invited, I can tell you that. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the investigations that are going on in terms of uh, World Health Organization, and I'll, I'll take it a step further. World Trade Organization, too. World Trade. We, we did years ago, years ago, many years ago, the World Trade Organization, from the day China came in, that's when China bloomed. They were mainlining it, and then, boom, they were up like a rocket ship because they took advantage of every little ridiculous clause in the World Trade Organization documents. They were a developing nation. China was a developing nation. They make the cars, they make the plant, they make everything, they make everything. And they're a developing nation. So we've had a — I might have gotten elected to a certain extent because of China and other countries. One of my big things was trade. The United States is getting ripped off in trade. Now Japan is paying $40 billion and buying a lot. That's before we even do the deal. U.S.-Mexico was a great deal. The NAFTA was one of the worst deals ever made in trade, in trade history. And uh, I would also put the World Trade Organization in that same group. So I was very tough on these countries. With China, we made the deal, and we became friendly. But then this happened, and this is uh, — this is tantamount. This is something that's really incredible. I do want to read the — the — something that I just saw today on television. I was looking, and I just said, uh, that's an interesting statement. Uh, we talk about uh, the Democrats, and it was a statement made by Brett Baer, good guy, smart. On February 19th, there was a Democratic debate in Las Vegas. That was February 19th. That's way after I closed entrance from China into our country. So Brett goes, on February 19th, there was a Democratic debate in Las Vegas. Three words weren't said during the debate. Virus coronavirus or COVID-19. Those three words never came up. That was uh, — I just thought it was a very interesting — because, you know, you hear these people, some of the people, the Democrats, said, oh, this, that. It never even was a part of their dialogue. Now they bring it up, because you see what happened so now, but they didn't bring it up. But I brought it up. I brought it up a long time before I made the trade deal, and uh, I was not easy to deal with. I was not easy to deal with. They understand that. We still have 25 percent on $250 billion that they have to pay us. And uh, it's a lot of money. We've taken in a lot of money, and we've had a lot of beneficiaries, including our farmers and ranchers. So in addition, we've launched an unprecedented effort to develop new treatments and therapies to battle the plague. Uh, therapies, to me, are the most exciting. The the. Vaccines are obviously so important, but the therapies are immediate, you know. And we have some things that are really looking good. 
really looking good. We call COVID Treatment Acceleration Program. We're accelerating all of these great companies that are looking. And we have government agencies looking, too, NIH. This extraordinary program is slashing red tape to speed and development anti-rival. And, and if you look at, if you look at uh, what we're doing in terms of the speed, it's unrivaled. It's totally unrivaled. There's never been anything like it. The FDA and Dr. Stephen Hahn, a highly respected man from a great institution, left that job to come here. Uh, the job he's doing is incredible. And we're working with Scott. His predecessor was terrific. We're working with a lot of people. But uh, the speed of development for antiviral, antibody, and immune therapies is uh, at a level that nobody thought even possible. And I will say this, we're getting very good results. It's a little soon yet. But if we could find the therapies that would solve the problem, if somebody has a problem, we can get it taken care of so it's not so devastating as it has been. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Vice President Pence to come up. And I have to say it's a Sunday, a Sunday evening. Uh, and uh, this man has not stopped. He's uh, working. We all are, in all fairness. But he's been working with his task force and everyone else around the clock for months. And I just want to thank Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, uh, and let me echo your words about all the dedicated men and women on the White House Coronavirus Task Force and the team that you assembled in January, and some of whom are with us today, Seema Verma with CMS, Admiral Girard with the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, Dr. Steve Hahn of the FDA and others represent a, a level of commitment and dedication that's been inspiring for me to have the privilege to work with. And so I thank you, I thank you for your gracious words. Uh, that White House Coronavirus Task Force met today. Uh, it uh, was reported to us that uh, at this moment, more than 746,000 Americans have tested positive for the coronavirus. Fortunately, more than 68,000 Americans have fully recovered. Uh, but sadly, more than 41,000 Americans uh, have lost their lives to the coronavirus. Uh, and we always want to express our deepest sympathies to the families in their loss, as well as to all the families who have loved ones that are struggling with this disease. Uh, today, um, we've seen encouraging news again about our progress as a nation. President Trump reflected on those momentarily, but um, the Coronavirus White House Task Force today learned that our large metro areas continue to stabilize and even see progress. The New York metro area, including New Jersey, New York, Long Island, Connecticut, and Rhode Island all appear to be past their peak. The Detroit metro area also appears to be past its peak and is stable. New Orleans metro area actually is the most stable of all areas where we had a major metropolitan outbreak. And the Denver uh, metro area uh, is stable. Uh, we're dealing in Colorado with a meatpacking plant uh, issue. And of course, California and Washington remain low uh, and steady. Areas that we continue to watch carefully on the task force include the Chicago metro area, Boston metro, and the Philadelphia metropolitan area. The progress that we are making uh, is a tribute uh, to the, the American people. It's a tribute to state and local leaders in all of these areas uh, and the partnership that our president has forged. But uh, we just want to encourage every American, uh, as we see this progress, to continue to, to heed your state and local authorities. Uh, I think the American people know no one wants to reopen America more than President Donald Trump. Uh, but uh, I want to assure you we're going to continue to work with governors of every state, with the president's guidelines for opening up America again, and we're going to work in a way that we can consolidate the progress that we have made and help move our states toward reopening our country. Uh, we also received a report today and the Coronavirus Task Force. At this point, uh, 5,528 military personnel have been deployed across 24 hospitals and facilities and 28,700 National Guard are on duty. 
Uh, on the subject of supplies, the President spoke about this at, at length, but uh, at the present moment, we have more than 9,055 ventilators on hand. We actually added 91 ventilators to that supply because of the production uh, that the President and our task force at FEMA has activated in the next seven days. We'll be adding 576 ventilators to the strategic national stockpile. As the President mentioned, our air bridge continues to work. 64 flights completed, 50 more flights on the horizon literally bringing in uh, medical equipment from around the country and around the world and deploying it to critical areas. Uh, finally, uh, tomorrow, as the President uh, announced, uh, we'll be hosting a conference call with all of the nation's governors, all the states and territories uh, from the headquarters at, at FEMA. Uh, and we'll be working with the governors uh, to ensure them that we're, we're helping them to uh, review and evaluate uh, the President's guidelines for opening up America again, uh, the criteria that we believe is appropriate to, to, and necessary before states can move into any phase one change in the mitigation strategies, but also at the President's direction tomorrow. We'll be providing all the nation's governors and all of their uh, health officials with detail about the testing infrastructure that exists all around the country. We'll be specifically providing uh, governors and state health officials with information about all of the lab capability that exists in their state. Uh, and also, uh, we'll be updating them uh, on our efforts to identify the kind of supplies the President just held up and our efforts to make sure that those supplies are at, uh, at all of those uh, laboratories as the need should arise. Remember that. Uh, a month ago, we had done 80,000 uh, coronavirus tests in America. This weekend, we cleared more than 4 million, and we're currently testing more than a million Americans a week. We fully expect to actually have tested more than 5 million Americans before the end of this month. But at the President's urging, we're going to continue to scale that testing and then work with governors to make sure that they can manage and implement and deploy that testing in the manner that will most support their efforts to move their states forward. Remember that the testing that is contemplated uh, in uh, the, uh, the uh, guidelines for opening up America again for phase one are, are testing people that have symptoms uh, that may be coronavirus and then also having the testing resources to deploy to vulnerable communities, nursing homes or other vulnerable communities in the, uh, that we have identified as needing additional what is called monitoring or surveillance testing. We believe we have the testing today around the country that would allow any state in America to move into phase one if they've met the other criteria, 14 days of consistent declines and strong hospital capacity so that the system would not be overwhelmed in the event of a flare-up. But we're going to be working with governors tomorrow on the subject of testing and supplies. And as the President said again uh, this evening, uh, we're here to help. Uh, we forged a partnership with governors around the country, uh, and tomorrow we'll be building on that partnership to hopefully arrive at the day that we can make sure governors around the nation have the best advice and the best resources to put America back to work. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, President. Very good. Same you've done such a great job. Please come up and say a couple of words. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President. So just a few weeks ago, we stood here and, and asked the American health care system to delay elective surgeries and procedures. And the reason why we did this is we wanted to make sure that the health care system could deal with any surges. We wanted to preserve equipment and make sure that they had the appropriate workforce to handle any surge. And our healthcare system did a fantastic job. They very quickly stood up telehealth services, and under the president's leadership, we started paying for these services under the Medicare program. But the reality is not everything can be addressed by telehealth. There may be a woman that needs surgery for breast cancer, um, somebody who has cataracts in their eyes that need to be able to see better, and sometimes a doctor just needs to be able to listen to their patient's heart. Um, we've heard across the country that doctor's offices have closed and many health care systems are furloughing their staff, nurses and doctors. Under the President's leadership, we've put out over $90 billion in accelerated payments under the Medicare program. 
uh, provided $30 billion of grants with more dollars on the way. But thanks to the American people, we are in a much different place. Um, you heard from the Vice President that there are many places around the country where they're seeing a decline in cases, and hospitals are reporting that they have unused capacity. And so as part of our opening up America, we are issuing guidelines today about how we can reopen the healthcare system. So these are recommendations around phase one. Now every state and local official has to assess the situation on the ground. They need to make sure that they can still address surges. They need to make sure that they have adequate supplies and a plan for conserving supplies. They need to be able to screen patients and healthcare workers for COVID virus. And they need to make sure that patients feel safe when they come in to seek health care services by assuring that they have the appropriate cleaning in place and that they observe social distancing inside the health care facilities. And this isn't going to be like a light switch. It's more like a sunrise where it's going to be a gradual process. And health care officials across the country and health care systems need to decide what services should be made available. And ultimately, doctors and patients need to make decisions about uh, their health care services. And we want to make sure that systems are reopening so that they can stay open and doing that in a very measured way. And I want to thank all the health care workers on the front lines who have done a fantastic job in providing care and comfort, um, serving as a liaison between family members. They've done a fantastic job, and we owe a debt of gratitude to them and to all those providers that did adhere to our guidelines. They did the right thing and it has made an extraordinary difference. I also want to take a couple of seconds here to talk about our nursing homes. Um, our hearts and minds are with the patients and the families of those living in nursing homes. This is an extraordinarily difficult situation. Um, people living in nursing homes are of the most vulnerable patients. They're elderly. Many of them have underlying health conditions. Um, and this has been a very hard situation, and I really appreciate the strong efforts of governors and local communities that have shown great leadership in supporting nursing homes across the country, particularly Governor Baker, Governor Hogan, that have had special efforts around supporting nursing homes. Um, FEMA is also working on a plan to make sure that nursing homes have the supplies that they need. And just last week, we increased the reimbursement in the Medicare program for high throughput tests. And we are also paying for labs to go out to nursing homes to collect samples. And that's going to really support efforts on the nursing homes in order to isolate patients. Um, today, we are also announcing, under the President's leadership, an effort around nursing home transparency. It's important that patients and their families have the information that they need, and they need to understand what's going on in the nursing home. And so today, we are announcing that we are requiring nursing homes to report to patients and their families if there are cases of COVID virus inside the nursing home. We are also requiring nursing homes to report directly to the CDC when they have cases of COVID virus. And this is very important, as you've heard Dr. Burks talk about, as we reopen the United States, our surveillance effort around the COVID virus will also begin in nursing homes. And so by having this reporting system, this will support CDC's efforts to have surveillance around the country and to support efforts around contact tracing so that we can mitigate the spread of the virus in those communities that show spread starting in the nursing homes. So again, I want to thank all of the local officials that have done an amazing job in supporting the nursing homes and would urge all state and local leaders to follow their lead and do everything that we can to keep nursing home residents safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Hahn is here. If you need, uh, he'll tell you uh, maybe a little bit later if you want this, but I can tell you that uh, very simply, uh, the level of, at which they're approving things, tests, and uh, being on top of the people that are doing the testing for uh, therapies and for vaccines has never, they've never seen anything like this. So I want to thank you very much and stick around. Maybe they'll have some questions. Okay. Uh, please go ahead. In the back. No, Mr. President, thank you very much. Um, if there were groups of people planning to protest tomorrow against the government shutdown, what would be your advice? 
against the shutdown? Well, yeah, that they want the shutdown lifted. Should they Maybe go they ahead if it's yeah. the state where hey, there haven't been 14 days? I don't have any arrests. Arrest. People feel that way. You're allowed to protest. I mean, they, they feel that way. I watched the protest, and they were all six feet apart. I mean, it was a very orderly group of people. And, uh, but, you know, some, some have gone too far. Some governors have gone too far. Some of the things that happened are uh, maybe not so appropriate. And I think in the end, it's not going to matter because we're starting to open up our states. And I think they're going to open up very well. We're going to be watching it. We're going to be watching it very closely. We're working with them on testing. We're working with them on whatever they need. I don't think they need ventilators anymore. Uh, I believe the, the term the governor used was phenomenal. We've done a phenomenal job. That was the term that — that was the only sentence they left out which is okay, but I, I, I appreciate that that's what Governor Cuomo said. But we have — they've done a phenomenal — these people have done a phenomenal job. Uh, as far as uh, uh, protesters, you know, I see protesters for all sorts of things. And uh, uh, I'm with everybody. I'm with everybody. Please, in the back. Go ahead. In the back. Go ahead. You ready? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Jen Pellegrino with LAN. Uh, yesterday, you pointed out that Iran was likely not truthful in the reporting of the virus. Uh, meanwhile, Senator Dianne Feinstein and other Democrats are looking for $5 billion in aid to Iran. Are you considering giving any aid to Iran? Uh, if Iran needed aid on this, I would be willing to do something if they want it, if they ask for it. I would be certainly willing. They were hit very hard. Obviously, those numbers weren't correct numbers that they reported. But if they needed help, if they needed aid, if they needed ventilators, we have thousands of ventilators uh, currently on hand and ventilators under construction, under uh, — that are under construction. That's a mosquito. I don't like mosquitoes. I don't like mosquitoes at all. Um, but uh, if they uh, — yeah, we would certainly be willing to help. Uh, what they should do is be smart and make a deal. It's only because of uh, — you know, you look at what happened, it's uh, — John Kerry, I guess, just doesn't want them to make a deal. And they're probably figuring they can wait, and uh, maybe it will be Biden, and they'll own America if Biden gets and, — and they know with me, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If, uh, if Joe Biden got in, they'd own America. Between them, China, Japan, Mexico, Canada, they'd own America. You wouldn't have a country left if he got in. Go ahead, please. First question, you mentioned that you've seen some governors, I think you said this yesterday, too, that some governors you think have gone too far. Which governors are you referring to, sir? Which states? I don't and want to mention — I don't want to mention names specifically. Uh, but obviously, uh, one we can mention that's this, but really much beyond this, is Virginia with what they've done on guns. Uh, he is playing with the, your Second Amendment. We can't allow that to happen. Uh, and that is — indirectly related to this, because you know what's happened with guns. People are buying guns at a level that you haven't seen before because of — because of this surge of, of — of plague. So what he did was totally inappropriate. Other than that, I'm not going to mention governors, but I have a list — one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. On money, sir, you mentioned off the top that you hope that a deal may come tomorrow on the small business loan program. Well, I hope so. You know, this morning, Mnuchin seemed like this was ready to go. It seemed like any second now. Is there, is there any change is there? You know, every time you say it's ready to go, then they say, oh, we have a good negotiating position now because he just said it's ready to go. So now let's see what happens. But uh, we want to put our — we want to take care of our workers. We want to take care of our small businesses. They're really the engine of this country. We have to take — when we open, we want to have those small businesses ready to go. We don't want — we don't want those businesses abandoned because they couldn't — afford their employees, they couldn't take care. And I want to take care of those employees. Well, what's the hold of now, sir? Well, just in terms I, of I can't tell you that. I can just tell you that we're negotiating with the Democrats. And, you know, they negotiate for things that we can't do, that we don't think are in the best interests of the people of this country. Uh, we are very close to a deal. I can't tell you whether or not we're going to get the deal or not. We're, who would say that? You want me to say we, we're going to have a deal before we have a deal? But we have a good that. chance of yeah. getting a deal. Uh, a lot of good discussions were had today. We have a good chance of getting the deal. We want the deal. We want to take care of our workers. We want to take care of our small companies. Mr. Uh, Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have a question for you and also for Dr. Hahn, if I may, after I get to your question. Sure. Uh, in your remarks uh, that you uh, made just a few moments ago, in regards to reopening the U.S. economy, you said, 
I want it to be safe. And that's a sentiment obviously shared by no, tens of millions of Americans. I want it to be safe. And absolutely. it seems at odds, Mr. President, with the tweet that you had on Friday about liberating those three particular states, Virginia, Minnesota, and Michigan, because none of those states, Mr. President, have met the requirements that the Vice President and others on the task force have talked about in terms of reopening the economy. Do you see those two Well, if you uh, take, if you take Michigan, there were things in the Michigan that I don't think they were necessary or appropriate. Everyone knows that. I think the governor of Michigan, we're getting along very well, but I think the governor of Michigan probably knows that. I think she probably wished she didn't put some of them in. You can't buy paint. You can't buy seeds. You have, I mean, where did this stuff come from? No, no. We're going to be safe. We have to be safe. And we don't want to close anything. We're not going to be closing. But we're going to be doing it beautifully, systematically. We're working very well with the governors. I mean, I would say pretty much almost all of them. A couple of them, no matter what you do, you'll never satisfy them. You could, you could find the cure tomorrow, and, and they wouldn't be satisfied. They'd find a reason to complain. Wise guys. But uh, for the most part, we're working very well with the governors. We have a great relationship with the governors. Uh, I can tell you, I've been on numerous calls with governors, and during those calls, I mean, without exception, they were friendly. And that's going back even a month, a month from today. So I think that we're going to do a, a terrific job. I think the governors are going to do a terrific job. And we're starting to open our country. And, you know, as you know, some I just spoke with Greg Abbott today from Texas. He's fantastic. He's a fantastic governor. And he's going to be opening up parts of Texas. And you're going to be opening up parts of other countries. You know what they uh, uh, other states. And you know what that is. And by the way, other countries are at a point where they're studying. I see where Germany's starting to op open up a little section. So there are a lot of great things happening. And uh, we're going to start to open our country. And we're going to do it. It's like, as I say, it's like a beautiful puzzle. A state might even be a portion of a state. You know, there are states, very big states. And you can have portions of states, Mike. You have a portion, you have a county, which is perfect, and you have another county that's a sort of still pretty far away, even if it's within the same state, and it's not doing so well. But they may open up parts. So we're going to do it very, very carefully, and uh, I think it's going to be uh, very successful. But when you say safe, I want it to be very safe. Thank you very much. Let him, let him just do this one. Then. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Hahn. Doctor. There's a question uh, that I don't know the answer to, and I was hoping that you could uh, provide an answer to. There's an epidemiologist uh, at the University of Alabama in Birmingham who's actually a COVID-19 survivor, and his name is Michael Say. And his question is this, why would the virus suddenly be different? And why would people's susceptibility be any different on May the 1st or on June the 1st? or on July the 1st. And this all relates to reopening the economy. Can, can you explain or give an answer to that particular question? I don't think we have uh, evidence that one would be more susceptible or less. What I think we can say is that the mitigation efforts have really helped with respect to this, um, and that uh, what we've seen is the number of cases have gone down. And if we follow the gating criteria for the opening, we're then able to institute phase one and have the appropriate measures in place to actually reduce any chance of flare-up of the cases. Is there a chance of a sort of rebounding uh, if, if you reopen too soon without uh, the type of mitigation efforts that we've had still in place? Yes, there's a chance. And I think Dr. Fauci and, and Dr. Burks talked about this at the podium. And the, the key here is the surveillance uh, that is being put in place with the CDC. I think that'll be a really great help in terms of trying to reduce that risk. Thank you. And I think they have the rest of that clip. I just thought it was a very good clip. Um, I think it's a tribute to New York. I think it's a tribute to the federal government. And I thought it was nice. So I think they have that now. They can try it. Go ahead. Have we saved everyone? No. But have we lost anyone because we didn't have a bed or we didn't have a ventilator or we didn't have health care staff? No. Uh, the w people we lost are the people we couldn't save. Not for lack of trying and not for lack of uh, doing everything that we could do as a society, not only as a government and as a health care system. Okay. Um, 
Thank yes, you. I did. I appreciate it. Um, since you shared with us something else that you saw on TV today, I have a question about something you said on Thursday, which is that you were angry because information about the virus should have been told to us earlier and a lot sooner. People knew it was happening, and people did not want to talk about it. Sorry. Many Americans are saying the exact same thing about you, that you should have warned them the virus was spreading like wildfire through the month of February instead of holding rallies with thousands of people. Why did you wait so long who you to with? warn who, them? Who you with? And why did you yeah. uh, not have social distancing until March 16th? Who are you with? I'm Weejia Jang with CBS News. So if you look at what I did, in terms of cutting off or banning China from coming in. Chinese nationals. But by the way, not Americans who are also nice coming from easy. China. Nice and easy. Just relax. We cut it off. People were amazed. These gentlemen, everybody was amazed that I did it. We had 21 people in a room. Everybody was against it but me. Dr. Fauci said, had I not done that, perhaps tens of thousands, and maybe much more than that, People would have died. I was very early, very, very early. And we just saw you saw Brett Baer making a statement. They had a debate well into February, and not even mentioned. It wasn't even mentioned, the Democrats. The we were very early. You oh, I'm, I'm the president. And you know what I just did? So and you know what I just did? And by the way, when you issued the ban, the virus was already here. Okay, and you know how many people, when I issued the ban, how many cases of virus were in the United States when I issued the ban? Do you know the number? There was no, no. How many already. cases? Remember, I said one person. How many cases were here when I issued the ban? But Tell did me. you know? No, no, no. You have to do your research. How many? I did my research on the 23rd of March. You said you knew this was going to be a pandemic. Can I tell you what? Well I did know it. I did know it. All I have to do is look. So you knew All it anybody knew it. Just are you ready? How many cases were in the United States when I did my ban? How many people had died in the United States? So do you that you didn't think Keep your voice down, please. Spread. Keep your voice down. Did you not? How many? How many? How many cases were in the United States? I did a ban, where I'm closing up the entire country. How many people died? And that's a fair point. How many people died in the United States? And yet I closed up the country, and I believe there were no deaths, zero deaths at the time I closed up the country. Nobody was there, and you should say thank you very much for good judgment. Go ahead, please. Uh, you just mentioned Germany. Uh, Germany is allowing small stores to open yes, tomorrow. Yes, they are. I just spoke to Does them. this give you confidence that some European countries are on the mend of recovery? Well, I hope so. I mean, we hope it works out. Look, I, I, spoke with, I, spoke with Angela, I spoke with Angela, and they're going to start a process of opening, very much like we are. We are, too. Um, I spoke with numerous governors. They're doing it also. Uh, areas that have been that where the number one, they've done a good job, or where they don't have much of a problem. Uh, Germany's starting the process also, yes, and I'm very happy about that. Some places in Europe, as you know, can't start the process for a while. Mr. President. Yes, ma'am, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I have two Nevada questions. First one, the mayor of Las Vegas thinks it's total insanity for business to be shut down in Nevada, which the governor says lack uh, ordered. Who's right? Well, they shut one of my hotels down, too. Okay, so, you know, I'm not involved in that. I could be if I wanted to. I just chose not to be. I, by the way, just so you know, I could be if I wanted to, but I chose not. But they closed a very big hotel that I have in Nevada down in Las Vegas. Uh, it's a very severe step he took. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. But, you know, you could call that one either way. I know the mayor's very upset with it. Some owners are very upset with it. Some of the uh, developers out there are very upset. Uh, others. They say, hey, we've got to get rid of it. I, I, can, I can see both sides of that. And I'd like to follow up uh, with one other question. Um, I asked you recently about an SBA rule that said that paycheck protection money could not go to small casinos. You said you'd look into it, and clearly something happened. They are looking into it right now. Because they, they do have, you know, they have small casinos that don't have too many people, and they are looking, and they're going to make a ruling, I understand, next week. They're, they already did make a ruling, and they changed it from uh, small casinos that make more than a third of their income couldn't qualify to have. I know, but they're looking at that. They're continuing to look at that. It's a big, it's a big topic, because a lot of people are involved. Let's give it a shot. Thank you. Um, you know, Governor Cuomo, as you played in that clip, has indeed praised a lot of what the federal government has done, but he... Not, excuse me, excuse me. He didn't say a lot. 
He said we did a phenomenal job. He didn't say a lot. He didn't say you did a good job on ventilators but nothing else. No, he said we did a phenomenal job. So report accurately, because you are one of the most inaccurate reporters. Go ahead. What he has said is that, and along with a bunch of Republican governors who have said what they need, though, is a national strategy when it comes to testing. Because on supplies, they say that they're competing yeah, yeah. against one another. Yeah, yeah. They Why said the not? same thing with ventilators, and now we have so many that we're going to be able to send them and help other countries that are in need. Uh, we're doing great on testing, and we are actually using the act, as you know, on a certain company. Yeah. But what about on the reagents? They say that that's something we, that they we're, can't get we're in great of. shape. It's so easy to get. That reagents and, and swabs are so easy to get. When you have to build a very expensive piece of machinery controlled by computers, that's a different thing. And uh, no, we'll have everything's going to be in very good shape very soon. We're going to be in very good shape very soon. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, just the latest uh, stimulus package, will that have funding for uh, states and local governments? Um, Mr. Well, I don't want to comment on it, but we will be saving that for another time. Will you be willing and to I, I, And by the way, some states and local governments need it. I'm the first one to admit that. We're going to be saving that for another little bit of a later date. will probably be our next negotiation. Okay. But they do. I'm in favor of it, I will say. And I told the Republicans today I had a I think a great talk with uh, Republican senators today, and all of them, I think, just about all of them, and a uh, conference call. And we are going to be — that'll be a very big topic over the next uh, couple of weeks. It's very important. And, and what is the administration doing to make sure that, uh, you know, hotel chains and, and hedge funds — Well, that's another access, one, yeah. Uh, no, that's cost. another one. You have hotels that are big, massive buildings that are under-levered. But if you have no income at all coming out, no income at all, uh, these hotels are — they go from under lever to — they have to be closed down. It's a terrible thing. Uh, I don't know that they're working on that specific problem, but it's a problem they should be talking about. I mean, you have people that own a hotel where they go from having a very successful hotel with, you know, many employees, thousands of people, to all of a sudden closing it down. I read where my wonderful place in Florida, in Miami, Doral. They had to let a lot of the employees go, because it's essentially closed. You can't use it. You're not, you can't have the restaurants. You can't have it. So, you know, you have to close it down. That's, a, that's an example. Uh, many, many hotels are closing down throughout the country, and hopefully they're going to be able to open up relatively quickly. But the funds are more specifically for small businesses. Um, yeah. Would you — would the administration well, it depends sure how the hotel is considered. You know, is it owned by a big chain? But even if it's owned by a big chain, that's devastating. If they have 200 hotels in the country and they're closed, and it's not only in the country. Remember this. This is all over the world. You know, if they have — they could have 2,000 hotels that are in other countries, they're also closed. We're in — we're in better shape than most, when you think about it. So I think we're going to be looking at it. I think it's a very big problem. And it's a lot of people employed. Yeah, here we go. Mr. President, uh, 22 — more than 22 million Americans are currently unemployed yeah. as a result of this. Uh, today, we hit the grim milestone of more than 40,000 Americans uh, now having died from the coronavirus. Um, can you explain, then, why you come out here and you are reading clips and, and, uh, and showing clips of praise for you and for your administration? Is this really the time for self-congratulations? Well, I, I will tell you this. What I'm doing is I'm standing up for the men and women that have done such an incredible job. Not for me. For the men and women, admirals, vice president, if I might, but all of the men and women, thousands, tens of thousands of them that built hospitals in New York and New Jersey and all over this country in record time to throw up a thousand beds in four days. I'm sticking up for those people. Those people have been incredible. I'm also sticking up for doctors and nurses and military doctors but and nurses. The clips that you played and, and what you read earlier was praising you and your well, administration. All I played today Why was Governor Cuomo to do that, sir? saying very positive things about the job the federal government has done. And those people and those, have now died. and those people have been just absolutely excoriated by some of the fake news, like you, your CNN, your fake news. And let me just tell you, they were excoriated by people like you that don't know any better because you don't have the brains you were born with. You should be praising the people that have done a good job, not doing what you do, even that question. So just so you understand, if we now, didn't do a the job — why now? Not why are you doing it, I'll tell it, you why, why now. now. Are you ready? Because these people are right now in hospitals. It's dangerous. It's going to a battlefield. 
And I want these people, I want you. This wasn't about I want you in the it's, 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 it's all about that. It's it's not about me. No, nothing's about me. You, look, right. look, you're never going to treat me fairly, many of you. And I understand that. I, I don't even know. I got here with the worst, most unfair press treatment, they say, in the history of the United States for a president. They did say Abraham Lincoln had very bad so treatment, too. Let, let me just tell you. It has your name in it. It talks about Trump remaking the playbook. Well, that's a positive thing, because that's an exercise in how to do it and what to do. And that's good for the future. People can learn from that. But I want the men and women of this country that are in danger, the admirals and the generals that have done a job like they've never done before. They're in war. We're in war. You know, I call it the invisible enemy. That's a war. And it's a dangerous war. We're also at a level when you said 40,000 people, and you're right, almost 40,000 people. And, and what ha — oh, more than. Okay, good. Correct me. Correct me. Correct me. Correct me. Good. Well, I'm really glad you corrected me, CNN. But here, here's the story. Let me just tell you something. If we didn't do what we did, the 40,000 right now could be a million people. Could be a million people, not 40,000. It could be a million. We're tracking at much less than the lowest possible estimate. And that's a great tribute to a number of people and a number of things. One of the things that it's a tribute to is what's taken place in this country with the American people. Because they've gone inside, they've done it. They've done a job that nobody thought was possible. And in fact, when they did the models, as they call them, nobody thought it was possible. They did models not based on this kind of success. I've seen New York streets, and I see it in the morning. I've watched all my life New York streets. And you can't even see the pavement. There's so many people. And you take a look this morning. You take a look. Even on Friday morning, I looked at it. I saw it through a camera. There wasn't a person on Fifth Avenue. There wasn't a person on Madison Avenue. I've never seen anything like it because people have really listened to instructions, and they've listened to what we've had to say, and the professionals, they've listened. And those people, sh people should really give them a lot of credit, including people like you, because you just don't have the sense to understand what's going on. All right. Yeah, please, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, should publicly traded companies like Shake Shack and Quantum Corp and Ruth's Chris, should they have access to the PPP program? Well, it would depend. It would depend. A lot of those — I don't know much about any of those companies, but uh, a lot of times they're owned by franchisees where they own one or two places, and, you know, they are small businesses. So a lot of that would uh, — that would depend on what the formula is. But, again, uh, many of those companies are — you know, they're out to franchisees. A franchisee could open up one of the places that you mentioned. And so, yeah, I would say that's important, actually. That's like a restaurant. Go ahead, please. You know, these uh, — you, you referred to these protests earlier. You know, some of them are getting pretty intense. And we're actually getting some death threats to some governors who are reluctant to — You are in the media? media? No, the governors are getting death threats. You know, governors of Kentucky, Michigan, Virginia, they're getting increased levels of death threats. And are you concerned that you're talking about liberation and the Second Amendment and all this stuff? No, are you inciting violence among a yeah. few people? I've seen the people. Life? I've seen interviews of the people. These are great people. Look, they want to get — they call cabin fever. You've heard the term? They've got cabin fever. They want to get back. They want their life back. Their life was taken away from them. And, you know, they learned a lot during this period. They learned to do things differently than they have in the past. And, you know, they'll do it, hopefully, until the virus has — Passed. And when the virus passes, I hope we're going to be sitting next to each other in baseball games, football games, basketball games, ice hockey games. I hope we're going to be sitting next to each other. I hope you have golf. To the Masters is going to have 100,000 people, not 25 people watching at the course. I mean, I, I am not, no, I'm not. I, I think these people are uh, — I've never seen so many American flags. I mean, I, I'm seeing the same thing that you're seeing. I don't They're see it any differently. There, too. They're who? Nazi flags. Well, that I totally would say, no way. But I've seen — I didn't see that. I see all — of course, I'm sure the news plays that up. I've seen American flags all over the place. I have never seen so many American flags at a rally as I have in these rallies. These people love our country. They want to get back to work. Please, go ahead. Talk more about pardoning Paul Manafort or Roger Stone so they're not exposed to coronavirus in jail. Well, I just tell you this. Uh, Roger Stone was treated very unfairly. Paul Manafort, the Black Book, turned out to be a fraud. We learned that out during the various last number of weeks and months. Uh, they had a Black Book that came out of Ukraine, turned out to be a fraud. 
Turned out to be a fraud. They convicted a man. Turned out to be a fraud. General Flynn was a highly respected person, and it turned out to be a scam on him. The FBI said he didn't lie. And Mueller's people wanted him to go to jail. Okay? So what am I going to do? You'll find out what I'm going to do. I'm not going to say what I'm going to do. But I will tell you, the whole thing turned out to be a scam, and it turned out to be a disgrace to our country. And it was a takedown of a duly elected president. And these people suffered greatly. General Flynn, I mean, what they did to him. And even the FBI said, and they had some, and nobody bigger fan of the FBI than me at the level of the people that really matter. But the top of the FBI was scum. And what they did to General Flynn, and you know it, and everybody knows it, was a disgrace. He was in the service for over 30 years. He ends up being a general and respected. Respected. And almost his first day in office, they come in with papers. They want to investigate him. Never happened before. And now the tables are turned. Investigate the investigators, I guess. These were crooked people. These are bad people. These are very dangerous people. You know what they are, though? They're scum. They're human scum. All right, do you want to have one in the back, please? Thank you, Mr. President. The CDC has finally admitted to profound failures with testing kits from the beginning of the outbreak. Is this a function of lax oversight from the Obama-Biden administration? Well, it's not from me. I mean, they came in, and uh, they had some problems early on, but we've straightened it out. But, yeah, look, uh, I told you, we inherited a lot of garbage. We took uh, — they had tests that were no good. They had — all the stuff was no good. It came from somewhere, so whoever — whoever came up with it. But uh, I'm proud to tell you that now we went from having a lot of bad things happening in CDC to having great things happening. We're — they're doing a very good job now. But, no, initially, look, uh, our stockpiles were empty. We had horrible stockpiles. We had horrible ventilators. We had very few of them, too. And so did the states have very few of them. But all of these things are now we're at a level that we've never been. Same with our military. Our military is the strongest it's ever been. We spent one and a half trillion dollars on our military. We've totally rebuilt our military. It's never been in a position. And we even have Space Force. Mike and I were talking about what an achievement that is. First time in 72 years we have a new force. So, uh, yeah, CDC had obsolete tests, old tests, broken tests, and a mess. But they've uh, — they've done a very good job. And they've done it under pressure. The pressure is, you know, this — they had to do this under pressure. So we're very proud of the job they've Mr. done. Mr. Please, go ahead. go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, you said swabs are easy. Um, and this has been something that hospitals and states have been saying there are shortages for more than a month now. Why wait to use the Defense Production Act until now? Well, we already have millions coming in. We have one company that we have to — we're forced to use it with. And probably by tomorrow we won't be. You know, it's a tremendous hammer. Uh, probably by tomorrow it won't be. But we have millions of them coming in. They're very easy. By comparison and, — and in all fairness, governors could get them themselves. They really could. All of this — but we're going to do it. We're going to work with the governors. And if they can't do it, we're going to do it. If they do it, we can do it maybe cheaper, better. We're going to get a very — we're getting very high quality. With us, it's all quality, too. Even if it takes a little bit longer, we want the highest quality in all of it, including the ventilators. So, uh, yeah, we're going to — we have millions of them coming in very soon. And many of them already have been ordered, and the governors don't know quite where they are, but they'll be finding them fairly soon. Mr. President, I'm on that. Mr. President, Mr. President, Xi, um, you, you now talk about the missteps that China made uh, early on in this crisis and how it put you — put the United States well, behind Well, based on an investigation, we're going to find out, yeah. So, sure. so when, when you repeatedly praised Xi in January and February, well, you start. said uh, he will solve the problem. You said he was doing a great job. Were you duped well, by President Xi? No, 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 no. I made a, a deal that's phenomenal uh, for the United States. No, you know who was duped? You. Exactly. You and, and the Obama administration were duped for years because China was ripping off this country like in the history of any country. Nobody's been ripped off like the United States by China and many other countries. And we stop it. And we've you done — we've done a — we've done a deal where they're paying us 250. They are buying 250. They didn't do anything for us. You know, we didn't even have a deal. It was so it's bad. The deal. These comments no, no, are after no, the deal. No, no, no. It's, it is about a deal, because the deal started a long time ago, before anybody heard about this. The deal was finished 
uh, a number of months ago. Very happy. I was very happy. I hope they were happy. Billions of dollars came in in tariffs. Billions of dollars. They're going to be purchasing billions. And then all of a sudden, long after that, I find out about this. Right, and I told you, I told you, I'm not. Listen, listen, CNN. Listen, CNN. I told you I'm not happy about it. And this was after the deal. So we have this wonderful deal. And I was very, nobody's been tougher before the deal ever on China than Trump. Then I made a deal. I was very happy with the deal. It's a great deal, great for our farmers. The farmers have been paid a fortune already. Then what happened? No mistake, we made a great deal. Now I find out after the deal, after the deal, not do it, after the deal, I find out that I'm not happy. You, you people are so pathetic at CNN. Let me just tell you. Sure. I was very happy with the deal, very happy with everything. Then we find out about the plague, right? The plague. And since we found out about that, I'm not happy. But I closed it up long before Pelosi. Listen, long before Pelosi, you know, she was having parties in San Francisco. Let's all go to Chinatown. And that was a long time after I closed up the country. Go ahead, please. That's why your ratings are so bad, because you're pathetic. Go ahead, let's go. Your ratings are terrible. you got to get back to real news. Go ahead. The first of the month is next week. So for people that are worried about whether or not they're going to see a stimulus check again next month, will there be another stimulus check? Well, we're looking at it. We're talking about it. Uh, it's the, the delivery has been very good, as you know. People are getting them, and they're happy. It's How saving money lives. Would this, would it be we will let you know when it's appropriate. But we're not going to let our people suffer. And exactly. you've seen that. By the way, you've seen that better than anyone. And you people have actually covered it with, you know, within, yeah, okay. But you've seen what's going on. And we got those checks out to people. It saved their lives. Nobody else could have done it. Are Nobody else could have done it. Should, and I'm very happy if we, if we get this new check out to the workers in these small, essentially to the workers in these small businesses, the PPP, we are going to be, uh, we're going to be very happy because as we open, those businesses are going to open along with us. Yeah, go ahead, please. Mr. President, as you start reopening the country, do you plan to coordinate with Mexico and Canada to ensure that the U.S. Yeah, manufacturers I can see that, too. We're coordinating right now with both. I spoke with the President of Mexico yesterday. I spoke with uh, uh, Prime Minister of Canada a lot, Justin. And uh, we're uh, in very good coordination right Justin, now. Sorry. The supply chain as companies here. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're doing the supply chain. It's not going to affect trade. That's part of trade, and it's not going to affect trade. And if it does, I will tell you, if a supply chain based in Mexico or Canada interrupts with our making a big product and an important product or a, even a military product, uh, we're not going to be happy. Let me tell you that. Go ahead, one or two more. Go ahead in the back. You didn't go. go Thank you very much. Who are you with? I'm with the Salt Lake Tribune. Okay. Good. Thank you, sir. On Thursday, the White House announced a congressional task force on reopening America. It included every Republican senator but Mitt Romney. Yeah. Does that show that you still, you're still holding a grudge against yeah, Mitt Romney? Yeah, it does. No, I'm not a fan of Mitt Romney at all. No, I had 52 Republican senators. He was a governor. You don't want his advice. Well, I just don't think, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of Mitt Romney. I don't really want his advice. Go ahead, please. Mr. President, why on that task force did you include uh, Senator Kelly Loeffler? There's some questions about whether she well, because she's the senator from uh, a great state, a state that I love, Georgia. But there's some insider trading. Well, I don't. That I don't know. I really don't know about that. But she's a uh, senator from Georgia, and she was included in the list. Absolutely. Go ahead. A couple of more. Uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. President, you spoke. You said you spoke to Angela Merkel and that the progress being made in Germany. And you spoke about many of the leaders. Yeah. Yeah, many of the countries that maybe have taken their eye off the ball and let coronavirus let rip in their countries. Um, which one were you, were you talking about? The UK. You mean some of the ones that didn't do well? Yeah. I'm not. I don't say that. But you just have to look. And some of them just got hit hard. When I closed up our border, when I did the ban on China, they say a lot of the people that didn't come in here went to Italy. You heard that. That's why Italy was hit so hard. Uh, I don't think it was because of government. I will say uh, Italy is locked down probably more than any other country right now. It's just absolutely locked solid down. But they got hit very hard because people that were coming to the United States couldn't come because I closed the country in January. And they went to Italy, they say. It had to do with trade. It had to do with the purchase of certain materials, and Italy was another alternative. And so uh, many, many people went to Italy instead of coming here, and 
Italy has suffered greatly. Now, I spoke with the Prime Minister a lot. He's a great friend of mine. And, and uh, what's happened to Italy is very, very tough. Uh, thank you all very much. We appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. I want to bring in now my colleague, Senior Jeremy Diamond, who was at that briefing tonight. Jeremy, uh, you had a contentious exchange with the president. We will get to that. But the president claiming that this testing is a local thing, dodging responsibility for that and other things. But it was just last month that he falsely insisted that anybody that needs a test gets a test. Yeah, the president really has tried to have it both ways on this testing issue, Don, particularly as it relates to what the federal government is responsible for and what the localities and the states are responsible for. We've seen the president and his administration come out to that very same uh, briefing room podium that we saw today and tout the number of tests that they've been able to ramp up capacity uh, across the country. And yet at the same time, we've also seen the president pass the buck over to governors of states and saying it's their job to do the testing. Testing's a local thing. Now, we did hear a little bit more about what the federal government is going to do to help some of these governors, and that is the president said that he's going to be invoking the Defense Production Act to ramp up uh, production of some of those testing swabs. Um, but at the same time, we also saw the president suggest that these governors simply are unwilling or unable uh, to do what they need to do to ramp up testing, saying that it's their fault. So there is a little bit of a disconnect here, Don, it seems, between what the president sees as the governor's responsibility and what hit the federal government is actually working to do to try and ramp up testing capacity. But nonetheless, it is very clear, Don, that the president and his administration do not see uh, ramping up testing from now going into the future as the federal government uh, responsibility. Okay, so Jeremy, another odd moment at the briefing, in the briefing room. Last week, uh, it was this propaganda video, the president playing, um, you know, self-congratulatory clips last week uh, in this video, mostly from uh, conservative media and Fox News. This one was a self-congratulatory clips from the New York governor, Andrew Cuomo. Again, an odd moment in the briefing room. I want to play this part of your exchange as well about that, about the clip that he played, and then we'll talk about it. Here he is. More than 22 million Americans are currently unemployed yeah. as a result of this. Uh, today we hit the grim milestone of more than 40,000 Americans uh, now having died from the coronavirus. Um, can you explain then why you come out here and you are reading clips and, and, uh, and showing clips of praise for you and for your administration? Is this really the time for self-congratulations? Well, I, I will tell you this. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm standing up for the men and women that have done such an incredible job. Not for me, for the men and women, admirals, vice president, if I might, but all of the men and women, thousands, tens of thousands of them that built hospitals in New York and New Jersey and all over this country in record time, that throw up a thousand beds in four days. I'm sticking up for those people. Those people have been incredible. I'm also sticking up for doctors and nurses and military doctors and nurses. The clips that you played and, and what you read earlier was praising you and your administration. All I played today was Why Governor Cuomo to do that, sir? saying very positive things about the job the federal government has done. And those, people, and, those, and those people have been just absolutely excoriated by some of the fake news. Uh, Jeremy, it seems like he is making your point because he played nothing about the people who are on the front lines. Everything he talked about was just him, 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 and what a great job that he's doing. He's actually defending himself. That, that's right. And, and that's why it kind of struck me as such a remarkable uh, split screen moment. You know, Don, we have 22 million Americans who have had to file for unemployment as a result of this coronavirus crisis. We now have more than 41,000 Americans who have died of this coronavirus crisis. Uh, and yet w I was sitting there in the briefing room watching the president talk about how wonderful everything is uh, and how well his administration has done. That's, there's a time for the president to perhaps tout the, you know, what his administration has done. And he can certainly 
make that case. That is his prerogative. But it just struck me as a pretty damning split screen to see the president saying that on the day where we have this grim milestone of more than 40,000 deaths. And, and it wasn't just, of course, uh, the clip that he played from Governor Cuomo praising the federal government's response. Uh, it was also that he read a, a headline from an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal. The headline is literally, Trump rewrites the book on emergencies. And yet somehow the president was claiming that what he was reading was not about him, but about other people, about the hospital workers, about the doctors. That's clearly not what the president was focused on today. Listen, Jeremy, make no mistake about it. These are my words. It's not yours because you have to uh, work at the White House every day and you have to work with these people. But does the president not understand that him coming out there every day and acting like a jerk is not going to help him with the American people? The American people are tired of it. Uh, it shows in the polling that people are watching every day because they want information about uh, saving lives. They want to know where they are, when they can actually go back to work, and not about what a great job he's doing when everyone knows there's not enough testing. People don't want to go back to work if there's not enough testing. People are reticent to go back to work if there aren't tests, if, if they don't know if uh, they have antibodies, if that's actually going to protect them from getting this virus. Does, is there a disconnect in the White House or with this president? Does anybody talk to him about that? Is, it, does anyone have the courage to stand up to this person, to this bully as we see him in this briefing room every day, to give him the, a real talk and say, hey, listen, you need to get out there and tell the American people the truth and stop acting like a big bully? Look, here's what I can say, Don. The president is always going to lean back on his instincts as a salesman, right? That, that's what his whole career, his whole life, whether in business or on reality TV, like that is what his <clears throat> life has been about, is about portraying things as better than they are, selling them as better than they are. So that is always uh, the instinct that the president is going to fall back on. Uh, now, uh, there are some officials at the White House who think that the president is doing himself a disservice uh, by coming out and speaking so much. There's a lot of grumbling among some Republicans uh, who wish that the president would perhaps allow the health experts to speak more. I mean, you had Admiral uh, Brett Girard, who is leading the effort on the testing front, which was uh, the main topic at today's briefing, and he sat in that chair. Uh, on the side of the briefing room throughout the entire news conference. Uh, and he did not come up uh, to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. He wasn't asked by the president to make any remarks. Uh, so look, the president has always viewed himself as his best communicator. That is why we have seen the, the White House go through press secretaries and communications directors at a rapid rate, because the president will never allow anybody else to kind of lead that messaging aspect. The president always sees himself uh, as best able to do that. And that's because, again, in 2016, the president proved other people wrong uh, by talking the way that he did uh, on the campaign trail. I want to ask you uh, as well, because we see these exchanges every day um, at, the, at the briefing. It has become, you know, everyday viewing to, to watch the president go off on reporters. But to watch him sit there and belittle, especially women, by telling him, he told Caitlin Collins, enough uh, last week. And he told this reporter today to, you know, lower your voice or what have you. But to consider, to sit there and to watch the president um, exhibit this sexist behavior that must be uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable for the people at home. What is it like sitting there in the briefing room uh, and to watch this, to experience this behavior? Uh, look, I, I, none of us like to see the president uh, belittle any of us or our colleagues uh, who are, you know, just trying to ask the president questions. Weijia Jiang of CBS News did a phenomenal job tonight. She was simply asking the president uh, about some of his uh, past comments and some of his past actions, um, and, and that is simply what we all in the in the press corps are going to continue to do: is simply ask the president questions uh, that are important that that people need to have answers to, uh, and that is, I think, uh, going to be our guiding mantra. The president also talked, uh, Jeremy, talked about the people protesting the stay-at-home orders. Watch this, please. They've got cabin fever. They want to get back. They want their life back. Their life was taken away from them. And, you know, they learned a lot during this period. They learned to do things differently than they have in the past. And, you know, they'll do it, hopefully, until the virus has passed. And when the virus passes, I hope we're going to be sitting next to each other in baseball games, football games, basketball games ice hockey games. I hope we're going to be sitting next to each other. I hope you have golf. To the Masters is going to have 100,000 people, not 25 people watching. Um, okay. Again, um, he it seems to be disconnected from the reality of the, the virus doesn't care how many, you know, how many people want sports back. Well, everybody wants sports back in business as, as usual. But he seems to want these protesters out there. And at one point he said that these protesters seem to be following the rules. Well, the rules are 
to stay at home, so they're disobeying the rules, yet he is championing, championing for these reporters, it seems, and they are not socially distancing. All you have to do is pick up your phone or look at the images that are out there on the Internet, and they are not following social distancing guidelines. They're not even following the rules that the president and the governors of their states have set. Yeah, there really has been mixed messaging on this front from the president, Don, because we see the president on Thursday uh, talking about these guidelines for reopening the country, talking about a gradual multi-phase process to allow businesses to reopen, to allow children to go back to school, uh, certain criteria that they need to hit. And then the next day we see the president tweet this, you know, liberate Michigan, liberate uh, Minnesota, liberate Virginia, states that have not yet hit the threshold uh, for actually beginning to reopen in, in the way that the president's own guidelines uh, envision this process happening. And, and I think one of the big factors why the president is backing these protests is, number one, uh, he wants to be viewed as the person who wants to reopen the country, doesn't want to be viewed as responsible for the economic devastation that this virus has wrought. Uh, and the president also knows that the people who are out there protesting in, in large percentages are his own supporters. In fact, we've seen conservative uh, groups organizing many of these protests in some of these different states. So anytime you have someone who likes the president, who's a supporter of the president, who's doing something, Something, it's going to be very hard to get the president to say what they're doing is wrong. Yeah, and we should make no mistake about it. The majority of people uh, are not doing what these protesters. They are actually against what these protesters are doing. This is a small major, a small minority of the country. Jeremy, I want you to stay with us. I want to bring in now Dr. Jonathan Reiner, the director of cardiac, cardiac and catheterization program at George Washington University. Also with us, CNN's Dana Bash. Thank you both for joining us. Listen, Dana, what is the president saying about testing and supplies tonight? Because governors are, are disputing his claim that there's enough coronavirus testing. It's an important question, and he started out his briefing talking about the fact that the United States has more than 4 million tests. I think he actually said that 4 million people have been tested, but I believe it's the, the truth is it's about 4 million tests. And then he talked about various countries in Europe and adding them all together, that that doesn't even come close to how many tests the United States has. All that might be true, but when you look at the per capita numbers, which is what matters, uh, it, it doesn't add up. And that's according to CNN's amazing fact-checking team. It, the U.S. is still behind when it comes to the per capita testing. And the other, so that's just on the, on the numbers. But the other important thing to remember is that and I know I have a lot of people uh, who I know have experienced this. I'm sure everybody on this panel as well, is that even though that there are a lot of tests, for the most part, you have to be symptomatic to get the tests, mm -hmm. or you have to be of a certain age group to get the tests, or a certain risk group to get the tests. And there are lots of people out there still who have even symptoms, who are told by their doctors, just stay home. It doesn't even matter if, you ha if you're tested positive or not, because they don't feel that there are enough tests to go around. That is not the place for a society or for you know, a universe of patients to be to get back to work and to get the economy back open. It just isn't. And so as much as the president and the vice president say till they're blue in the face that testing is where it needs to be for their so-called phase one, we heard all day long from governors in both parties who are there scrounging around for the very test that the federal government says that they have. They're saying, no, we do not. We don't have the things to go along with it. Maybe, maybe the president is going to add more swabs, which is important uh, to, to changing that, reagents, other components to this very complex notion of what we kind of summarize as testing. Dr. Ryan, I want you to weigh on the, this question of testing because yeah. there, there are so many unknowns here, especially when you consider a, a country of 350 million plus and you look at just how many people have actually been tested. It's just really, I mean, a, a, a really small number of people. And then you look at, um, you know, the, even Dr. Burke said, even if you have the antibodies, they don't even know if that protects you at this point because so little is actually known about the virus. There are so many unknowns here, yet the president is putting on this, this painting, this rosy picture about where we actually are at the moment when it comes to the coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah, the president has been uh, promulgating a, a fiction that we have all the tests we need. Uh, I, I pulled the data this weekend. Since April 1st, uh, the U.S. has performed about 145,000 tests per day. Now, the problem with that is that that has been level. 
So we have sort of plateaued in our ability to test. And you can see that one of the bottlenecks is uh, swabs, something as, as prosaic as a swab. If you look at the positivity rate, the proportion of patients who get tested who test positive, it's incredibly high. It's 20%, which means that docs are selecting people who are most likely to be positive for the virus to be tested. In other countries where testing is much more uh, available, the positivity rate is much lower. So in Germany, for instance, mm -hmm. the positivity rate is only 7% because they're testing much more widely than we are here in the United States. Jeremy, the president doesn't seem to have a handle on how to relate to the nation's governor. I mean, sometimes he's blaming them, sometimes he's praising them. I, I, I wonder why there's such a lack of consistency in his approach because in his praise, right, he, what he doesn't understand is that it, he has, the governors have had to push him to get to this point where there is an abundance of ventilators, where there is an abundance of whatever it is that they need, because they had to push him to this point to get those supplies. Yeah, and, and one of the new arguments that we're hearing from the president uh, as he's being pressed on this issue of testing shortages is he seems to be comparing it to when the governors were asking him for additional ventilators and, and oftentimes more ventilators than they ultimately needed. Uh, but the president is suggesting that that's because the governors were asking for too many ventilators when the reality seems to be uh, that it's because the curve was flattened in some of those states, right? That there were fewer cases than anticipated because the social distancing measures in those places worked. Uh, and obviously those governors were in many cases preparing for worst case or medium case uh, scenarios. And just because those didn't come to be doesn't mean that those governors were going way out of proportion in terms of what they needed. But it seems that the president is now using that same logic and applying it to this testing issue, which seems to explain why he feels that the federal government doesn't need to do as much as some of these state governors are, are, are saying that he needs to do. Dr. Reiner, I have to ask you, instead of uh, patting himself on the back so much and talking about all the excesses that the governors asked for and they got they asked for too much and all of that and on and on, Shouldn't the president actually, if you look at all the modeling from all the different agencies, including the president's own, uh, the government, uh, independent uh, agencies, other countries, so on and so forth, shouldn't the president actually be thanking the American people for following the social distancing guidelines so that we were able to flatten the curve? They listened in ways that, um, that should be congratulated instead of patting himself on the back for being too late and then having to rush to put these systems in place? Yeah, he should be thanking the American people for doing what they were asked to do at great uh, personal hardship. He should be thanking the nurses and docs and food service workers in hospitals who day after day run into the fire and put themselves at enormous personal risk. You know, America, America has been suffering and people have been very valiant, but you know, this, is, this has been portrayed as sort of every, every state for themselves every person for themselves. You know, we really need more leadership coming from the federal government. Thank you, Doctor. Dana, thank you. And Jeremy, thank you. You handle yourself once again very well in the briefing today Amen. at the White House. Thank you. Thank you very much.